My name is Jennifer Ingham, and I'm the Vice President of Development here at Science World. I want to wish everyone a very warm welcome and for joining us tonight at Science World and all the amazing guests that we have this evening. We're very excited and intrigued to have the lecture as part of the Unveiling the Universe lecture series held by Triumph, a wonderful partner of ours. This is where it all begins. Science World is a place where we inspire and engage young children, teenagers, and adults to get excited about science and technology. In this building and around the province, we provide fun, interactive, educational opportunities to encourage and develop leadership in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, healthcare, and the list continues. In a year, we'll have over 500 people visit this building and over 160,000 students, teachers, and families across the province that are touched by our programs. We are very pleased to acknowledge a few special guests this evening. We have the UK Science Attaché in Vancouver, Dr. Paolo Marcanza, here with us this evening along with a number of our Science World board members, which we're pleased to have join us for this special time. Developing and inspiring our leaders of tomorrow happens because of the wonderful partnerships we have with our friends and colleagues from Triumph. Partnerships like this expand what Science World offers, which is more than a place for families and children to come and explore. We've had the wonderful opportunity to have our students from Future Science Leaders program intern at Triumph and be inspired by the physicists and the work that they do. We invite you to bring us your ideas of how Science World can engage you and enjoy this evening. It is now with great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Marcello Pavana, Triumph Outreach Programmer, Coordinator, sorry. Yeah. Hanging up here, That's doing all these other That's things. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Indeed, it's, it's wonderful, this partnership we've developed between Triumph and Science World. This is the third lecture in the Unveiling the Universe series, and there'll be a fourth one this summer in July. So uh, check your emails and check your junk mail. Sometimes they end up there. July 12th, uh, put that in your calendar. Details to be unveiled later, pardon the pun. And it's really wonderful to see so many people coming to a, a physics talk on a, on a Thursday night in Vancouver. No, normally, at my parties that I throw, and one of my buddies is here tonight, he can confirm that when I start talking physics, the place clears out. And here you all coming to listen to a physics talk. Now, of course, it may have something to do with the quality of the speaker uh, talking the physics. And uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, the distinguished uh, accelerator physicist and head of the accelerator division at Triumph, uh, Dr. Leah Merminga. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends of science, future scientists. It is an honor and inspiration for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lynn Evans. Lynn got his PhD in physics from the University of Wales in 1970. He has received numerous awards and prizes in his career, but I want to point out two of them. One is the 2008 American Physical Society Wilson Prize for Achievement in the Physics of Particle Accelerators. And the second one is the 2012 Fundamental Physics Prize from the Milner Foundation. But Lynn is best known as the project leader of the Large Hadron Collider, the magnificent particle accelerator at CERN in Geneva, whose spectacular performance led to the recent discovery of the Higgs boson. This discovery has opened up a new era in particle physics. The international physics community is gathering momentum and organizing itself towards the next facility to study the properties of this new boson with exquisite detail and unprecedented precision and to continue the search for new elementary particles and for new physics. This new facility will be the world's next accelerator project, an international linear collider of comparable complexity and technical challenge, but also of equal promise as the LHC. 
At this crossroads of particle physics and accelerator science, Lynn Evans is a strong common thread as he will be at the helm of the new Linear Collider Collaboration, a new team that will advance the Linear Collider project through hopefully to its realization. And just as Lynn guided the way of the LHC to its fantastic success, he will again ably lead the new international project, bringing a wealth of technical and leadership experience and undoubtedly success. This historical transition to the new Linear Collider team is going to take place tomorrow at Triumph, Canada's National Laboratory for Particle and Nuclear Physics. And in much the same way Canada, through Triumph, contributed substantially to the LHC, we aspire to again participate in the next major international instrument of scientific discovery that Lynn is heading. So, let us enjoy and be inspired by Lynn Evans. Are there any Irish in the audience? Well, I, I, I think there are, um, so we won't talk about rugby. So today, tonight I'm going, to, I'm going to try to take you through the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. The, the title of the talk is Back to the Big Bang, the Large Hadron Collider and more. But um, I, I don't think I'm going to have too much time for more. Uh, now, so I want to start by trying to explain to you uh, what the LHC has got to do with the Big Bang. Uh, and then I will go on and uh, take three of the most fundamental problems in science that the LHC is uh, designed uh, to address. And I think that one of them we, we probably have already solved. Uh, I will say something about the unique features of the Large Hadron Collider uh, as an engineering challenge and feat, um, and of course, something about the Higgs boson. So uh, this is a, um, a, a picture of the a picture of the plane of Geneva, where you can see uh, the Geneva Airport uh, and. The city of, this is going to be terrible for my neck, by the way, for sure. For sure. Uh, the, the city of the G Geneva and the Alps in the, in the distance. Uh, and you see this trace here of this enormous particle accelerator, in fact, two particle accelerators, uh, which is a large hadron collider. Uh, this, and this thing is 27 kilometers in circumference, 100 meters underground, so you don't really see anything. Um, and this is a picture of the LHC in, in its tunnel. Uh, this ring here uh, is, is the one that I, I cut my teeth on in the, in the early 70s. Uh, it's called the Super Proton Synchrotron. It was, it was the frontier machine of, of the time. Uh, now it is the injector to the Large Hadron Collider. So that's a feature in CERN. We continuously reuse infrastructure that, we, uh, that we'd um, uh, had in the past. Now, a very brief introduction to CERN. Uh, CERN was founded in 1954, only nine years after the, the end of the Second World War. Uh, that was already quite remarkable. Uh, there was still Russian in Britain in those days. Uh, and it was founded for a number of purposes, uh, for, of course, one of them being to reunite uh, scientific Europe. Uh, and, and another was to create a facility that only the great superpowers could could afford, United States and Russia, uh, large accelerators, uh, and it certainly succeeded in doing that. There were, there were 12 member states originally. Uh, now there are 20 member states. But uh, what is most impressive is the number of users of CERN, because CERN is, is a facility uh, where groups from universities and institutes all around the world come and collaborate and do experiments. Only a core team actually runs the facility. And this is a, uh, 
a map of the users of, of CERN, you can see apart from the glaring whole of Africa, uh, it's practically the whole world now. Uh, in blue are the CERN member states, and these are the number of, of physicists from each, each of the countries, uh, the 20 member states of CERN. Then there are a number of countries which have a, a status of observer. Canada could have easily be, have been accepted as observer, but they didn't want to. Um, given the size of their contribution to the, to the Large Hadron Collider, there's one candidate for accession at the moment, which is uh, Romania, uh, and some associate members. And then there's a the whole United Nations, sometimes big, sometimes small, from countries uh, all over the world. And where's Canada? Canada uh, has got 140 physicists working on CERN experiments. So it is a real United Nations of, of science. So what do we do at CERN? I think everybody knows this uh, equation. Um, this equation says the equivalence of energy and mass. And uh, we are quite familiar now of, of converting a small amount of mass into energy, as in a nuclear reactor. At CERN, we go the other way. We convert energy into mass. Uh, and if you want to create a very massive object, that occurred only in the very early universe, then you need a lot of energy. You need high energy. So we are uh, in the process of producing, um, converting energy into mass and producing new particles. Now, um, mass and energy are equivalent. In fact, uh, we, uh, energy, uh, we define it as electron volts. That's uh, the energy that an electron would get accelerated through one volt, and that's equivalent to a very, very tiny mass. So when I talk about mass, I will be talking in electron volts, or millions of electron volts, or thousand millions of electron volts. Now, temperature is also a form of energy. And if you wanted to create a, a one electron volt by heating an electron, then you would need 11,600 degrees. Uh, and that already tells you something about the world that we live in, because when you want to cook a piece of meat in the oven, you cook it at 200 degrees. So to break the molecular bonds, you are using thousands of an electron volt effectively. But in our, our accelerators, uh, and in the LHC, we can, we can um, accelerate particles to give a, a thousand billion electron volts, one tera electron volt, which is equivalent to, ten to an unbelievable temperature of 10 to the 16 degrees centigrade. And, uh, you know, the, the sun is 5,000 degrees. 10 to the 16 degrees centigrade, of course, only occurred in the very earliest moments of, of our universe. And this is a sort of a cartoon of our universe as it expanded and cooled from the, the moment of the, of the Big Bang, um, which, uh, as unbelievable as it is, I think the evidence is overwhelming now. Uh, and this, this cartoon, is, you, you, you can't read it very well. It's not very bright, but uh, it's, it shows that the... the okay. Uh, so this is the cooling and expansion, expansion of our universe, and it's in a very, very nonlinear uh, scale of time. Time is going along in this, in this way, and I always do this, uh, pressing the wrong buttons. And uh, a few markers here. This is 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, uh, uh, hundreds of a billionth of a second. Uh, this is 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, this is one billion years. And this is today, which is about 13 and a half billion years. Now, if we want to look back towards our, uh, uh, the creation of the universe, uh, the first thing we can do is with, with optical uh, telescopes. Since the speed of light is constant, then if you look at very, very distant objects, you see them as they were uh, uh, 
in the time that the light took to, 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 to get to us. And we can, we can get, go back about 12 billion years using the Hubble. Uh, we can see early star galaxy formations uh, about a billion years after the, uh, after the Big Bang or 12 billion years ago. If we wanted to go further back than that, we can do it. We can look at what is called the cosmic microwave background. And the cosmic microwave background, up, up, to, up to this time, that was 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Before that, the, 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 the plasma was so hot that uh, light just couldn't, could not escape. As, for instance, you can't see the center of the sun. Uh, light is trapped until the, uh, the universe cooled enough for atoms to start to form, which was at, at this point in time, atoms started to form um, it, and the universe became cool enough to liberate that radiation. That radiation was, was very high energy at, at that time, but now the universe is cooled and stretched. That radiation is now stretched and it is in the microwave region of the spectrum. Um, and that's called the cosmic microwave background. And that, that can give us a lot of information uh, of 300,000 years. The Large Hadron Collider goes back to 10 to the minus 10, minus 10 of a second after the Big Bang. So that's why it's called the Big Bang Machine. Now, the LHC is a particle accelerator, uh, and I'm going to explain to you in one minute, how a particle accelerator works, or at least this kind of particle accelerator. The, 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 the one in Triumph is a similar but, but different principle. Well, it uses exactly the same fundamental principles. So you saw that the, the, there was this ring of 27 kilometers in circumference. Uh, that ring is full of e electromagnets. Uh, and if you have a particle beam, a charged particle beam, can't do it with neutral beam, but a charged beam, then a beam moving in a magnetic field is deflected. And if you, if you, if you want to bend the bend beam around in a circle, then uh, you have to have a vertical field which deflects horizontally. But it doesn't accelerate, it only guides. So the trick is that somewhere on the circumference, you have a uh, a, a, a radio frequency cavity, and this cavity is a, is a, is a, a, a copper or superconducting, in this case, box, in which case in, there is a radio transmitter putting in a lot of energy, producing el electromagnetic wave and a, an electric field, an oscillating electric field, uh, which is wing longitudinal. And particles can accelerate or decelerate in an electric field. And the trick is that this oscillating electric field here is exactly synchronous with the revolution of the particle, so that every time the particle is going through this cavity, it gets a little kick and its energy increases. Its energy increases, so the magnetic field has got to increase because it's harder to bend to guide the part, to keep the particles on the orbit. And since the particle is going, is going faster and faster, at least until it becomes relativistic, then the frequency in this cavity has to change. So it's very simple. I mean, you, you, you have an RF cavity in which you put in electromagnetic energy, which gives a longitudinal electric field. You synchronize the revolution frequency so the electric field is always pushing, um, and you keep it in synchronism. And you raise the magnetic field as the energy is increasing, and of course you come to some point where the magnetic field uh, saturates. All magnets have uh, limit, limit, uh, limits, and that's the maximum en energy you can get out of your accelerator. Uh, and of course, uh, in the LHC, in order to get very high energy, we have to go into very advanced uh, technology, which is superconductivity for the magnets. Uh, up until the, the 1960s, the early 60s, uh, we used to do physics like this. We, we used to have an accelerator, part, which would accelerate the particles up to the point where the magnets saturate. Then we would kick them out of the machine and hit a 
fixed target, just, just like Rutherford did when he discovered the, uh, the atomic nucleus, bombarding um, a gold foil, actually, with alpha particles, which are nat natural, natural accelerated because of radioactive decay. Um, and then one would pr produce uh, secondary particles, which one could study. Uh, and, of course, the mass of these se secondary particles is limited by the energy available, mass against energy again, but the energy available in what we call the center of mass in the rest frame of the, of, of the system. Uh, and you would imagine if, uh, if you're hitting a fixed target, a lot of that energy is, is going into propelling the target forward, not into, into giving energy that can be converted into mass. So this is a very inefficient way of producing uh, he heavy particles. In fact, the center of mass energy only goes up as the square root of the beam energy, so very slowly. Uh, in the 60s, beginning of the 60s, then new techniques started to be developed where one could have colliding beams, so two beams going around in opposite directions, and then one would uh, collide them at some point on the circumference, and then, of course, the whole of the energy is available. So there's a huge boost and that one can... Uh, produce uh, heavier particles. Now, uh, the particles have to be charged, uh, and there are, I mean, basically, there, there is, the choice is the electron uh, for negative charge particles, so the electron has got negative charge. The electron is a purely fundamental particle, um, and it's very interesting for colliding two, two electrons together you know precisely what the energy is in the, se in the center of mass. And the, uh, the, the, the decay products are very simple and easy to analyze. Then you can produce the uh, nucle nuclei, and the, 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 the lightest nucleus is the proton, the nucleus of hydrogen. Uh, but the proton is a complex object. The proton contains three quarks, the quarks are the fundamental objects uh, which are held together by a force called the gluon force. And um, when you collide two protons together, imagine colliding oranges together. Uh, very occasionally you will get the hard collision between the pips, like the hard collision between the quarks, which is what you're interested in, but all the time you get the pulp. So the environment when you use these protons is a, a dirty one, um, but it, it, there are certainly some advantages that I want to try to explain to you. And over the years, the way that particle physics has progressed, this is called a, 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 the Livingston chart. This is a, a chart, this is, this is a year of, of first operation, and this is the energy available uh, out of these, these are all colliding beam machines that have been built around the world. Uh, and the energy available on a log scale, and uh, we've been roughly going up exponentially in, in, in energy. Uh, and there are a fun, number of funny names of machines that have been built over the years. Uh, the first real production machine was called Adoni. This was built in Frascati in Italy. Uh, came online at the end of the 60s. Actually, the first production machines came at in, 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 in end of 60s, early 70s, experimental machines before that. Uh, the next one was called Spear. This was in Stanford, and Spear is still actually operating um, as a synchrotron light source. I, I will explain what that is in a moment. And then there have been a number of machines over the years going up and up in energy until uh, the, the, last machine, the last circular machine that was built and will ever be built, probably, uh, was left at CERN. I want you to, be, to remember Adoni and Spear because there, there there's a story which uh, I want to tell you about how uh, things can be, can be missed. And the collisions coming from a, uh, an electron machine are, are very simple and clean. So this is actually a, de a detector so you'll have to get used to this. Uh, this is a cross-section, so the two beams are, are, going in, are going into the board and coming from the other direction. They're colliding. Uh, they are producing pure energy, 
which is then converted into, in, in, into, into mass, into resonances, which decay very rapidly and shoot off particles. Uh, this is an example of a decay into two muons. Muons are heavy electrons. Um, and, and here you, 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 will, you will see something which you, you, some of the conservation laws. First of all, the energy of the energy of the muons is equal to the mass of the, of, of the electron, of the energy of the, of the electron. And you see that they are going off back to back because the law of conservation of momentum says that the, 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 the momentum before and the momentum afterwards have to be the same. There is a lot of momentum longitudinally, but none transversely. So in this case, uh, the net momentum transverse has to be zero, so we have to go back, back to back. Very, very simple to analyze very simple to work with. This is an event coming out of the LHC with protons. Uh, and you can see it's quite a different uh, business. You, you can see all, all, the, all, the, all the pulp. Um, but actually, over the years, uh, and originally when we started working with these machines, uh, people said you, you'll never, get, it's like colliding two switch watches together to see what they're made of. Uh, you, you'll never get any physics out of this, but this, it turned out not to be true. Um, and these uh, are, the, uh, are very, very powerful discovery machines, and the LHC is a proton-proton collider. Now, uh, if, the, if electrons are so beautiful, um, why do we have to go to protons? And don't be frightened. This is the only equation that I, I will use tonight. But the fact is that, that uh, there is one consequence of accelerating electrons, is that when you bend them around in, in a circular orbit, they emit light. That light is called synchrotron radiation. And actually, there are, we build machines specifically to produce synchrotron radiation. It's collimated X-rays, which are then used in order to investigate the properties of materials, the properties of, uh, of molecular structure, etc., cetera, um, which, which have their own purpose. But the trouble is that that synchrotron radiation has to be put back into the beam. That is power that is lost from the beam that's going to be put back oh, just to keep it at constant energy. And uh, this equation says that the synchrotron radiation power goes as the fourth power of the energy. So that means that if you want to uh, build a machine which, is, which has got twice the energy, then you have 16 times more power to put back in, into, into it. So you can see it's a losing game. You cannot go higher and higher uh, the, the price is far too high. A fourth power law is it's impossible to beat in the end. Uh, but this, actually, this gamma is the, is the energy divided by the rest, en rest energy, uh, the, the mass divided by the rest mass. And with protons, the rest mass is 2,000 times higher than with electrons. So you've got 2,000 to the power of four in the denominator here, so that synchrotron radiation is negligible. So for, you, you can accelerate protons to very high energy, but for electrons, you're stuck if you want to use the conventional technique of a, a, a circular machine. And in the introduction, you heard about a new, mach new machine which will overcome those difficulties eventually. And if I have time, I will get to it in the end. Now, this is a complex uh, picture, but this is actually um, a, a data coming out in, in, in in 10 minutes of operation of the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and and th this will il illustrate the, 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 the power of discovery of, of the machine. The deficiencies being the, the dirty events, but the real power is here. So what this is, is looking at e e events that are all sorts of ways that the, these, these particles decay. Uh, this is a, a dimuon event, so it's like the very simple one I showed which shooting off two muons, measuring the sum of the energy of the two, two muons, and then plotting them as the number of times it happens. And what you see here is, is, is a huge background due to processes that we, that we, that we understand. Uh, but on top of that background, you see resonances. These are particles. These are quark, anti-quark bound states. And these are the particles that the helped us to piece together the, the model of physics, the very simple model, standard model of physics that we know today. Um, some of these resonances are very famous. Uh, this is the 
the Z zero or the Z as the Americans call it. Uh, and we have in the audience tonight Professor Alan Asprey, who was uh, part of the team that discovered the Z zero in 1984 at CERN, uh, which, which was a, a tremendous discovery at the, at, at the time. The one that I want to tell you a little story about is the Jape Psi, because that was a resonance which really opened, opened our eyes in, into what was going on. Because at the time, you remember, there was a Adone and this, this spear. Adone was sitting there with an energy just below the resonance. It didn't know that it, it was there, and there was no incentive to push higher. Spear was making scans in, in small steps, and suddenly discovered as you, you know, as you increase the energy to get up to this peak, suddenly the, the rate of, of events shoots up enormously. This is a log scale. So Spear discovered the JPSI. They telephoned to, 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 to Frascati and said, push your machine just a little further um, and you will uh, find a new particle. Uh, in two days, they had found it as well. Of course, uh, Spear got a Nobel Prize, Slack got a Nobel Prize, uh, and Frascati got nothing because they just didn't know it was there. But with proton-proton collisions, I, I told you that there are three quarks uh, in, in, in a proton. Uh, the distribution of energy between the quarks is, 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 not, is not known a priori. It is, it, it is uh, randomly distributed. So every single collision between two quarks has got a different energy. So in a proton machine, you are sampling the whole range, and the LHC has been built so that you, you sample the whole possible range of where the Higgs, for example, could be. Um, so this is a real discovery machine, not like an electron machine where you really have to know where to go. You know, uh, but once you do know where to go, then, then it is ve the work, you, it's very precise. Uh, in fact, uh, after the discovery in the in the, in the proton-antiproton collider of CERN that Alan was uh, a member of the collaboration. Uh, then another electron machine was built uh, and the, the precise properties were, were measured, but only because they knew where, where to go. So that's the beauty of, of, of the proton machine. You have, you have to deal with the, uh, the, the, the downside of digging out data from um, a very large part of the data is junk. Uh, a Higgs boson is, is produced one in a thousand million times a, a collisions will be a Higgs boson. Uh, in an electron machine uh, at the same energy, then it would be one in a hundred. Okay, nevertheless, I think our understanding of, of nature now has gone to a point where uh, we have a very, very simple picture of nature and at, at its most fundamental level. And that's called the standard model of physics, and this is it. This is what we are made of. In fact, what we are made of is not that, which is just this. So here we have matter particles, which uh, consist of two quarks. The, they call the up quark, the down quark. It consists of, and these form the atomic nucleus consists of a neutrino, which is responsible for radioactive decay and uh, is the reason that we are, we are here on this Earth, because of the, the light from the sun, for instance, and the electron. These uh, particles have properties. Uh, they have mass. Each one has a mass. Each one has an electric charge, um, and each one has a spin. Electric charge is normally, I mean, you, you, you have a charge of one on, on the electron. The quarks are uh, unusual. They've got a fractional charge, two-thirds and minus one-third here. And all of these particles are called fermions, and they are spin one-half. Now, spin is a quantum number, um, which is uh, attributed to, to particles, but you may think it's a completely esoteric uh, and abstract thing. But when you go into an MRI scanner, then uh, what is happening without your permission or knowledge is that the spin of the, uh, of, of the, the, the protons in your, in your body is being flipped. And then you listen to the echo as the spin comes back to its original 
configuration, and that's how they produce these beautiful images. So these are the matter particles. And then we have four force particles. The forces of nature. Uh, this is the photon. This is a particle of light. Uh, the quantum of the electromagnetic field. And these all, all have spin one. And remember spin one at the very end when we come to the Higgs. They all have spin one. Uh, the photon has no mass. Uh, the, the, Z, I, uh, the Z and the W were, bo were both discovered in, in, uh, in Alan's experiment in the, in the, uh, at the University of Victoria, by the way, if I didn't say so, in, 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 in the early 80s. Uh, these are the forces responsible for the weak force for electromagnetic decay, for, for the light from the sun that keeps us alive, etc. Now, there is one force here which is missing, and that's the force of gravity. And, and, the, and this really doesn't fit into our model at all. It's, it's 20 orders of magnitude weaker than, uh, than, than these forces. Um, and, and, and integrating gravity into the standard model has not been <coughs> done yet. And you see how you can make up all matter now from, from, uh, from, from just this. The proton, uh, you take two up, up quarks. The charge is uh, two thirds, so two times two thirds is four thirds. One down uh, quark, charge of minus one third. So that's charge one. Charge plus one, that's a proton. You hold it together with the, the gluon force, holding the, the quarks together inside the proton. Uh, if you want to make a neutron, which is the uh, other element of, 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 of atoms in, in our world, then you take an up and two down quarks. You, you can show that that is charge zero, which is neutral. Again, with the gluon force holding it together. If you want to make an atom of hydrogen, then you take the electron, uh, and in the, in the very simple picture, you, you've got the electron orbiting the uh, nucleus using the electromagnetic force to hold it in place, and you've got the proton. And with protons and neutrons, then you can build all the rest of our universe. But we've discovered that there are actually uh, three families of mass particles which do not exist uh, in nature now. We, we, have, we, we can produce them in our, in our um, uh, particle accelerators. Uh, and there are heavy cousins of all of these particles. Here you've got the electron, you've, you've got the muon, which I, I've already spoken about, which is a heavy electron and an even heavier one. Uh, these two other families, we do not know what they are, were useful for. We know they were there, but we do not, and we can make them but we do not know what they are useful for. So now the first fundamental question is mass. What is mass? What is the origin of mass? Here, here you see now the mass, take, take the family of, 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 uh, of electrons, uh, from our electron, in, which is in our real world, to the to heavy cousins. Uh, the electron has got, got, a, got a mass of 500.5 of a million volts. The muon has got a mass of 105 million volts, and the tau lepton is 1,700 million volts. Uh, the heaviest particle that we, that, we, that we know, that we've created, is 171 billion volts. So why are the masses so different of all, of, of all these, these particles? Well, the, the, the theory there, which we are very now close to proving, is the theory of the Higgs field. And it's a very difficult thing to explain, actually, uh, the Higgs field, how the Higgs gives mass to, to particles. One analogy, which is tot totally wrong, is something that you, you are very familiar with. What you are familiar with is weight. And weight is mass in a gravitational field. If you're in a strong gra gravitational field, you, you have weight. If, if you are, if, so you're coupling strongly to the, to the field, you have weight. If you do not couple strongly to the field, if you're in the space station, you are weightless. You've still got mass, but you're weightless. So this is, a, is not a good analogy because here the gravitational field is, 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 go, is going down. Uh, with, with the Higgs mechanism, it is the strength of the coupling of, the, of particles to the Higgs field. There is a Higgs field in a, all of our universe. And the strength of the coupling of the particle to the Higgs field gives it mass. 
if, a, if it doesn't couple to the X field, it's got zero mass, like the photon, and can go at the speed of light. Uh, if it couples strongly, then it is heavy. And if that mechanism is, is correct, like any field, uh, like the for electromagnetic field, there is a quantum of the field. It's called the photon, the particle of light. Then the, the, if, if the Higgs field exists, there should be a quantum of the Higgs field, and that is the Higgs particle. So the, that, that is the first thing that the LSE has been built, is we, didn't, we did not know, we, we do know now, we probably do know now, but we did not know what the mass would be, so we built the LHC that we would cover the whole spectrum uh, where, uh, where it could, could conceivably be. Okay, now uh, this is uh, the, 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 the picture. Um, the standard model. Of course, there is a mirror of that in the world of antimatter. So exactly the same. Every matter particle has got it's Amtimat Cousin, and uh, I don't know who has read this book or seen the film, Angels and Demons. Uh, this is a film about um, uh, uh, people who stole antimatter from CERN uh, and wanted to use it to, to blow up the Vatican because when matter and antimatter come together, they annihilate and they, they give off uh, energy and can, can be enormous energy. So these guys are supposed to come into CERN and, and pick up this antimatter and taking it away. And of course, we do make antimatter in CERN, uh, but it's not exactly something that you could put on your arm and carry away with you. <laughs> so, so this is the antiproton accumulator at CERN, where, where, where we, we can accumulate um, uh, antiprotons and do experiments with them. And some of the experiments we, we do, I, I think, um, I, I'm going to show you now an example of an annihilation. Uh, and there are several purposes to this. First of all, to introduce you to a, the most simple detector that you could imagine. But then I'm going to make a little digression um, and show you how uh, a discovery that was made, I mean, if I, if I, if I go to antimatter, uh, Dirac predicted the existence of antimatter in 1928 of the anti-electron. The anti-electron was discovered in 1934 in cosmic rays, uh, and now I'm going to show you um, an application in the real world of, of, of antimatter that is becoming um, quite, quite common. So this is a very simple detector, simplest detector that could be. Uh, it is, what you see here, I must say it's not very, very bright, but these are blocks of crystals, of a, of, of a crystal called cesium iodide in blocks. And cesium iodide, if a, uh, a, a, a gamma ray, a photon of, of, of high energy goes through it, it gives, a, it gives a, a pulse of light. And here you see an annihilation. Here you see, forget about this, this is too complicated. This is the, 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 the atomic nucleus uh, decaying. But here you see in, in red an annihilation of, of an electron with an anti-electron. So we've stored anti-electrons in a trap. Um, there's a, there, there is a, a very high vacuum in here, but there are some atoms always. And when an electron comes into contact with an anti-electron, they annihilate each other. And when they annihilate, they have to obey the laws of physics, the laws of conservation of energy and momentum. So uh, they annihilate and they give off two photons, two particles of light. We know what the, uh, the energy of these, of, of these photons is, is, is going to be. It's equal to the mass of the electron, 511 kilovolts. But we also know that the law of conservation of momentum has to uh, be respected. And since there was no net momentum when they were, uh, before, there can be no net momentum afterwards. So they, again, they shoot off back to back. So in this detector, what, all that we detect is a, is a pulse of light here and a pulse of light there. But we know that we can draw a straight line between the two. We cannot see this track here. In the most sophisticated detectors of the LEC, we, we will see, we actually see the track very well. But in, in this case, we cannot see the track. All we can draw is a straight line as the two hits in the two, uh, in, in, in the two crystals. Now, imagine that 
uh, that this is full of matter and there is a blob of antimatter somewhere. Then the antimatter and the matter will annihilate. Uh, these, they will shoot off in, in arbitrary directions, but always back to back. So you will be getting hits all over the place. So you can draw straight lines all over the place. And where they all join will be the location of that antimatter. So you, you, can, you can see where the blob of antimatter was in the matter. And um, this is now being used in a, a, a very powerful new medical imaging technique uh, called positron emission tomography. Uh, in fact, the, the PET scanner is used always in conjunction with a CT scan, which is, a, which is an X-ray, very precise X-ray. So you can see what, what happens is that uh, you, can, you can produce a, a, a glucose analogy uh, called FDG, fluoroxyglucose, where a hydrogen atom of the, gluc of the glucose is replaced by a fluorine atom, which has been in one of our accelerators, has been irradiated to give an isotope, fluorine-18, which emits an anti-electron. It decays and emits an anti-electron. This glucose is injected into a patient and it accumulates in regions of high metabolic activity. And then the patient is scanned after a certain time, simultaneously with CT scan. So you've got a picture of tumorosity and on top of it a picture of high metabolic activity. Uh, and of course, this is uh, a way of scanning the whole body for cancer metastase or, uh, and, and other things, differentiating benign from malignant tumors, uh, which, is, which is now becoming, I'm sure there, were the, 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 there is at least one of these machines in Vancouver. But uh, that's an application of an anti antimatter in our real life uh, with, with the, dis the pre prediction in 1928 and the discovery in 1934 and this in the last few years. Okay, now that was a digression, so let's get back to the, to the real second question that the LHC is, uh, is built to address. This is now a picture of the cos cosmic back uh, microwave background that I mentioned earlier. This is the light that was liberated in the early universe uh, that is cooled, and what this is is the temperature Distribution. It's an absolutely fantastic, incredible experiment done on, on satellites uh, in our whole universe, the temperature distribution of, of that radiation. Uh, one thing that is, is fantastic is that uh, the temperature, in, you know, the, the, these are, these are color-coded with temperature variations, uh, and the temperature is uniform to one ten thousandth of a degree. And this is another huge piece in the puzzle of the, of the, the Big Bang. Uh, that is perfect thermal equilibrium, and you, you, you can't, uh, I mean, a cup of coffee is in thermal equilibrium because the molecules are bouncing against each other. It's interacting. In the universe today, you cannot possibly interact. It, it shows that, uh, that at some point in the past, they were close enough together to thermalize. So this is a beautiful picture of the cosmic microwave back, uh, background radiation. The temperature of that radiation is 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and I, maybe I should introduce the Kelvin scale of temperature now because I will use it in future. Zero Kelvin is the absolute zero of temperature. You cannot go below it. Everything freezes, if you like. And that's minus 273 uh, degrees centigrade. So when I talk about the Kelvin scale of temperature, 2.7 Kelvin is about two, minus 270 degrees centigrade. That's the temperature of our universe today, not in this room, fortunately, but uh, out in uh, uh, intergalactic space. Now, but now comes the real point, you see. When we, when we make antimatter in our accelerators, we make precisely the same amount of matter. If that had been the case in the, in, in the, the very early universe, then the matter and antimatter would have annihilated, uh, and this would be our universe. There would be no place for us in it. So there is a very tiny asymmetry uh, between mat matter and antimatter, which is responsible for our very existence. What is the source of this asymmetry is question number two that the LHC is built to try to answer. And question number three, of course, is the issue of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, this is a nice picture of a spiral galaxy, um, which you can't do much with. 
But spiral, uh, spiral galaxies, which are on their side, these are rotating. These galaxies are rotating. Uh, and you can actually measure the, their rotational velocity as a function of the radius by using the Doppler shift. The Doppler shift is what catches you speeding. Um, that, is, that, that is a shift in frequency uh, of, 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 uh, of the light coming from these objects uh, as it's coming towards you uh, toward, in the blue direction. And there's a shift to, towards the red uh, of the of the objects that are moving away from you. And therefore, you can measure the, the, the rotation of speed as a function of the radius. Now, what you would expect, and this has been done now for many, many, many uh, galaxies, uh, and this is one galaxy, uh, M33, uh, where you're measuring the the rotation of frequency of stars, which are way outside the luminous region of the, of the galaxy. What you would expect is that as you go further out, then the rotation of speed goes down as the gravitational field uh, reduces. What you see is the exact opposite. This is a real measurement, that as you go f away from the, from, from the luminous disk, then the gravitational field is increasing. And the only way that can be explained is that there is, that, that, that there is material there which has got a gravitational attraction, but we cannot see it. We do not know what it is, and that is called dark matter. And dark matter, um, and, and this is another picture uh, where it, this is two colliding galactic clusters called the Bullock galaxies, uh, which, have, which have collided with each other, and we can reproduce uh, using a special technique called gravitational lensing, we can see where the gravitational the active zones are, uh, and we can also see where the luminous zones are. And this has been computer enhanced, and you see these two clusters where the two luminous zones, they've gone through each other, uh, but the, there's a huge amount of, of um, material here which is producing a gravitational field which has just completely gone through each other without interacting, whereas the hot gas interacted. That is dark matter. That, that's been known actually for, 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 for quite a long time. Even in the 1930s, it, there, were, there were ideas that things were not quite right with this, um, with, with, with this business. Uh, but in more recent times, I think uh, in the last 10 years, there's also been a phenomenon called dark energy, uh, where measuring the, uh, the speed of recession of, of, uh, of, of special supernova, uh, one expected to see them slowing down as the gra gravitational speed uh, uh, field reduced. You see the exact opposite. It's speeding up like as if there's anti-gravity. Gravity attracts, anti-gravity repels. That's called dark energy. And um, when, you, when you put it all together, it makes you feel very humble indeed. Because from our calculations, 74% of our universe is made of dark energy, 22% of dark matter. And this is the universe we understand. This is the universe that we can observe, measly 4%. So what is dark matter? What is dark energy? Those are the three big questions that the LHC has been um, built to, to address. And I think one of them, we already have a, a very good step. So to build the LHC, we need the, the building blocks. So the LHC is built on two pillars. Uh, and I want to explain to you, I, I'm, here I'm going to uh, tell you about a, a scientific mystery, actually, uh, with a little Canadian twist of, uh, of, of, of the two pillars on which the LHC is built. The LHC is built using superconductivity. You, you all know about superconductors. These are materials which uh, conduct electricity without any resistance, but only at very low temperature. So uh, they were discovered when we one learned to liquefy helium. Helium is, is, was the last gas to be liquefied. Helium uh, liquefies at 4.2 Kelvin. Okay, so you, uh, you subtract that from minus 273 and you get 268, minus 268 to be centigrade. Uh, and uh, helium was first liquefied in 1908 by Kamerlingonis in, uh, in the, the laboratory in the Netherlands. And he used it to measure the properties of materials at, at very low temperature. And he discovered 
the first superconductor, which was actually mercury, uh, where he discovered that he was measuring its electrical resistance uh, um, as the, uh, the temperature was, was reduced. Uh, and, the, of course, the resistance goes down as the temperature goes down, always because the, mo the, the atoms are uh, vibrating less in the, in, in the lattice, so the electrons make it easier to go through. But what he discovered was not just low resistance, was absolutely zero resistance at a, a, a special threshold. Um, he, he uh, where, where did I go there? Yeah. So that was, that, that was Mercury, the first superconductor, superconductor that he, he discovered, goes to absolutely to zero, absolutely to zero uh, resistance. And he got very excited about that because um, he, he realized that maybe he could produce very powerful magnets by uh, putting current through these, 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 uh, these um, conductors, uh, winding them into a coil and putting very high currents but he got water in his wine straight away when he discovered that there is a critical field, a critical current. Uh, he said at first, the production of strong magnetic fields using coils with, without iron. And then he said, after this lecture was given, there was a surprising result that he discovered that as, it, as he increased the current in the superconductor, at some point, it, was, it wasn't superconducting anymore. It, it, so he, he discovered the critical, the, the critical current. So if you want to make a very powerful magnet, you need a lot of current. Uh, but fortunately, he also discovered that if he reduced the temperature of the liquid cooled on further, then that critical current will go up and you could make more powerful magnets. Now, in doing that, he had to reduce the temperature uh, of the liquid from 4.2 Kelvin, which is a normal boiling point. And we knew that he could go down to 1.5 Kelvin. And the technique that he, he uses, it, the same as we are using in the LHC, actually, uh, every uh, self-respecting Englishman knows that his tea tastes less good at the top of a high mountain than at sea level. Uh, and that is because the atmospheric pressure is lower um, and therefore water boils at a lower temperature if you have a lower pressure. Uh, and that's what he did, did with his helium. He had big pumps that reduced the pressure above the, uh, uh, the helium, and then the temperature would go down. And it's exactly the same as we use in the LHC. Um, he got the Nobel Prize in 1913. Uh, and in his, his Nobel lecture, there, there was an aside but he noticed something about the liquid, this time not about the superconductor, but about the, the liquid that he was cooling with it. As he noticed a strange thing, because he should have noticed something much more basic. It's very noticeable that, that the experiments indicate that the density of the helium, which at first quickly drops, reaches a maximum at 2.2 Kelvin approximately. Uh, and if one goes down further, it drops more. So he, see, he, he noticed there was a peak in the density of the liquid. Something funny was going on. Now comes the great mystery, because I'm going to show you uh, the uh, liquid helium as, as the temperature is reducing uh, from, from, not from 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a little video clip. And it starts at 2.3 Kelvin. So the pressure has already been reduced when I, when I start this thing off. And what you will see is this helium violently boiling. Uh, and I want you to, to see what happens as we go down to a temperature of precisely 2.17 Kelvin. So look, let's hope it works. OK, watch this. You see the liquid is boiling. The pressure is reducing, therefore the temperature is going down. Oh. Oh. It's all right, I can do it again. Okay, let's, let's start it off again. I keep my fingers off the... So the temperature is going down, as you see. And look what happens as we go to this very special temperature.
Now, he, no, he noticed that the, the density was doing something funny, but he never said anything about that happening. What is happening here is that the, 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 the helium is going through a phase transition and it's becoming quantum liquid, a completely bizarre liquid with completely bizarre properties. And these completely bizarre properties are properties that we are using in the LHC as an engineering material to push the boundaries of what we can do. What is happening here is one of the properties of, of the helium uh, when it gets into this, uh, to this state is that it's got a huge thermal conductivity. Um, I might as well show it again while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, now, a liquid boils because there is a temperature gradient between the bottom and the top. The bottom is hotter than the top, therefore the bubbles form and, and come to the surface. If the conductivity is so huge that there cannot be a temperature gradient between the bottom and the top, the liquid cannot boil. Um, and that's what you're, you're seeing here. Now, in, uh, uh, Kamerling had a, a, a monopoly of, of helium uh, from 1908 until 1924, the only place in the world where liquid helium could be made and experiments w w could be done w in his lab. And in 1924, the second liquefier came online at the University of Toronto. I think um, Canada had a big stockpile of, of helium f uh, from, the, from the British from the World War I. Um, and, and so the, the, the second refrigerator came online and they did a lot of work on superconductivity. Uh, one of the people uh, named Jack Allen who worked in Toronto, he, he moved to Cambridge and he discovered the, the very, very special nature of this liquid. But in 1988, he wrote, he wrote this in physics world. In my PhD work in Toronto on superconductivity, I had often seen a sudden cessation of boiling at the lambda temp temperature, chi lambda, but had never paid it a particular attention. Never occurred to me that it was of fundamental significance. I mean, this is like seeing uh, water turn into ice, right? And not asking what, what's going on here. It took 30 years. And that's the mystery. 30 years before it was realized, uh, the discovery was simultaneous with the Russians Kapitsa in, in Moscow and Jack Allen and Misnet, two Canadians in Cambridge. Uh, Kapitsa got the Nobel Prize. Ka Allen and Misnet got nothing, and nobody understands why. The, 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 the papers were published side by side. I want to show you another bizarre feature of this liquid, again, that we use as an engineered fluid. And this time, it's, it's an example. This is a beaker, which has got a non-glazed ceramic base. So it's very, very slightly porous. It, in any normal liquid, there's no problem. But look what happens. As you, you will recognize now the transition, the phase transition. It'll be fast this time. And you, you'll see what happens afterwards. You see the liquid boiling, phase transition, and you, you can't see it very well here, but the liquid is pouring out of the bottom of this vessel. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, another, another of the properties of, of this crazy liquid is that it's, uh, its viscosity is zero. It goes through the t tiniest of capillaries. And these are the two things that we use in building the LHC. We use Superconductivity on one side and superfluidity on the other. Our superconductors are a bit more sophisticated than Kamerling's. Um, here you see a piece of superconducting cable that we use to wind the coil of the LHC. The, the cable contains strands that look like copper wire. Copper is not a superconductor. It's only the matrix that's holding the superconductor. If you etch away the strands with acid, then what you find inside each strand, you find 9,000 filaments of niobium titanium alloy, which is the real superconductor, 9,000 filaments, 6 microns in diameter. And this is a micrograph of one of these strands. So this is the superconductor that we use to, uh, to build the magnets that we need for the LHC. Uh, we know how to make electromagnets. We've known for 100 years that you put two coils, these are called Helmholtz coils, if you want to produce a very uniform magnetic field, uh, you have two coils uh, and, and put an electrical current through. The trick that we use in the LHC is basically to stretch these coils to be 15 meters long 
uh, and then you can make a long magnetic fields uh, which is guiding the particles. I said that the, the LEC has got two rings and in fact there are, this is now, you saw the, 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 blue, the, the blue tubes uh, which is all you can see in the tunnel. Uh, this is a cross section now what's inside those tubes. You've got the superconducting coils, two superconducting coils for the two beams in, a, in steel collars in a very uh, strong structure because when you put the, the, the current in these coils of 12,000 amperes, then the force is 500 tons per meter, so that's one jumbo jet per meter that you have to hold uh, in, in the force. Uh, and all of this is cooled to, not to 2.1 Kelvin, but even lower, to 1.9 Kelvin, in order that the superconductor, can, uh, the, the, the critical field, the critical current in the, in the superconductor can be increased and to get the highest possible magnetic field. And of course, this has got to be very well insulated inside an evacuated uh, cryostat with just very well insulated legs. And that is the, the heart of the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, uh, and this is a picture of the LHC, and this is an illustration of, uh, of one of the properties that I mentioned to you. What this is, is the uh, three and a half kilometers. The LHC is 27 kilometers in, in circumference. It's basically in eight sectors, each one three and a half kilometers. Uh, and at the end of one sector, there will be a refrigerator, which, which is producing the liquid helium to cool the whole sector. Normally, in, in any normal material, you would have a temperature gradient along that sector. Uh, and these, these are all, thermo, uh, these are all uh, thermometers in all of the magnets around one sector, 154 of them in one sector, measuring the, the temperature. Uh, and you see, it, it, it is incredibly uniform, uh, within one hundredth of a degree centigrade, because it cannot be otherwise. If there was a temperature difference, then heat would flow to compensate because the, 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 the uh, thermal conductivity is so high. So it, it is one of the tricks that we, that we use in order to keep the LHC at. Now, I, I'm going to have to go faster, otherwise, I, the trouble is I can't see if you're asleep or not. <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to do just a very, a very quick uh, slideshow, just, just to give you a flavor of, of what it means uh, to, to, have, to have built this machine. Uh, it, it was built in industry. Here is a picture of the coil uh, winding. You can see here uh, a machine which goes up and down. Uh, this is a mandrel where the coil is laid, and you can see you can see the ends of a coil here. This is the tricky part, actually, is getting this, the conductor around the ends and going back and winding this very long coil. Um, this is where. The, uh, the, the magnet is put into its yoke, into this very strong structure. So you can see coal masses, as we call them, here, uh, with this welding machine making longitudinal wells. And actually, it's not welded straight, it's welded in a banana, uh, because the beam is, is, is curving inside the magnet, and there is a 12 millimeter sagita along, along a magnet, which is put in, in, up, in that welding machine. The magnets are brought to CERN, the coal masses are brought to CERN, inserted into their cryostats, and then tested. Uh, every one of them is, is taken down to 1.9 Kelvin, minus 271 degrees centigrade, uh, and tested at high field. Uh, then the magnets are put down into the tunnel. There is only one shaft which is big enough to, to take them. Um, then they are transported inside the tunnel, nothing, nothing on the surface, otherwise there would be chaos around. Uh, uh, and the furthest distance they have to go is 15 kilometers. At three kilometers an hour, not a funny job. It, 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 it's wise to get an education. Um, and you can see here the, 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 how tight things are. Uh, transporting these magnets on a, on a uh, you, you see an a, a automatic guide. Uh, then they are installed on uh, very precise jacks, aligned to better than a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, interconnected welding uh, of the, all, all the pipe work. Uh, they have to be joined, to, joined together, they, they're only, all in series, so these, these superconductors have to be spliced together from magnet to magnet. 
And some of you, you remember that one of these splices failed uh, during initial tests and co cost us a lot of time. Uh, now, the LHC is, a, is, is mostly built by CERN, but also uh, international partnership, and a, a lot has been done by Canada. This is a, uh, uh, some very special magnets that, that were built in Canada under, under the supervision of Triumph. Uh, these came from India. The, uh, these are uh, units for producing the very cold helium from Japan. Uh, some special magnets from the United States. Uh, these came from Russia, so they are from all around the world. Now, I'm really, I'm really uh, losing time now, um, but I'm, I'm, I must tell you something about the experiments and the, the Higgs. So if, if you'd give me 10 minutes, uh, then I would appreciate it. So the, uh, the experiments. Uh, it's all very well having these beams going round and round, but at some point you've got to bring them into into collision, uh, where there is a detector that can detect the, the decay products. And this is a, a cartoon of, of, of the LHC, 100 meters underground approximately. And there are actually four detectors uh, in underground halls, two small ones. Uh, this is LHC B. This is, this is specially designed to look at matter antimatter asymmetry. Uh, and this is Alice, which is specially designed to actually look at what is called the quark gluon plasma, um, which, which, which is uh, also very specialized. But the two big general purpose de detectors are called CMS and ATLAS. And Canada is a member of the ATLAS collaboration. So we had to build uh, these caverns underground. It was, it was very interesting. For, uh, although I was in charge, I don't know anything about it, of course, uh, civil engineering. So you're always impressed by things that you don't understand. Um, and and this, was, this was actually a, a very interesting. Building of the Atlas Cavern, uh, what they did, they cast the vault. This, don't forget, it's 100 meters underground. They cast the vault first, and then they sp suspended the vault with, on steel cables from the surface, just hanging there as they excavated the rest of the cavern. Um, and then they concreted from the bottom up, and you can see the last, last pour of concrete going in there. And once that was done, then the cables were relaxed and the vault sits on top of the walls. So that was Atlas. CMS was interesting, uh, on the, uh, diametrically opposed to Atlas. And in CMS, uh, as soon as we started to prepare the work site for di di digging these caverns, we've, we ended up in a problem we discovered a uh, Roman farm, the foundations of a Roman farm, 4th century AD, immediately everything had to stop uh, for an archaeological dig. But it was very interesting, and you can see something very interesting on that picture there. Um, and I'll tell you what it is. It is that the, you, see the, you see the foundations of the farm, they are precisely aligned with the fields of today, 4th century. Um, and, this is, uh, and this is not a preferred direction. So this shows that the, the cadastre, as they say in French, uh, the land registry, if you like, was laid out by the Romans uh, at that time and has never been changed. The land has been cut up, but never been the, the orientation. And uh, uh, actually, the, there was some quite interesting discovery. There were some coins found. Uh, and these coins come, the, the, these about 360 AD, and they come from three places. Some come from Ostia, which was the ancient port of Rome. Some come from Lyon, which is not, not, not too far away from Geneva. And some come from London, 360 AD. And my English friends, I tell them that uh, at least at 360 AD, they were part of a common European currency. <laughs> but I, I, I also tell them, in those days, of course, you didn't have any choice. Uh, Driving the, 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 the CMS, uh, 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 first of all, the pit to lower the experiment, that, that posed difficulty because there was a lot of groundwater. And actually, in the end, the way we had to do it was to sink uh, pipes. Here, there are pipes going 80 meters underground and pumping liquid nitrogen through and, and freezing, making an ice wall around the structure and then excavating inside. Uh, well, just some nice pictures of, 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 of CMS, the breakthrough into the tunnel. 
Um, and, and here, an, uh, a nice picture of the, the inauguration of the Atlas Cavern. I like this one, and not just because it shows the, well, it, it, the cavern is nice, nice and clean now. Um, this is the president of Switzerland, uh, Pascal Kuspin. But what I like about it is a, a very brave friend of mine, and uh, there's not enough definition here, but up there, there is a guy playing an alpine horn. Uh, and, and it was, the, the effect was fantastic in the cavern, I tell you. Um, he, 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 he's now retired, he was the head of the survey group at CERN, and not only did he play the alpine horn, uh, but, but he makes them. Uh, and af af after that event, uh, something even more spectacular happened. He came up to the surface, and he played with the CERN jazz band. Uh, and if you've never heard um, Charles played on an alpine horn, then there's something lacking in your musical education, I can tell you. <laughs> so, um, now uh, I, I, I quickly go through the, the, the experiments. These, these are huge detectors um, made to, to capture all the decay products and to measure the energy. This is Atlas. Um, Atlas has got uh, 3,000 scientists from 172 institutes in 37 countries collaborating in, in building that detector. Um, and uh, 157, I think, of those are from, are from Canada. Uh, this is a very good, Atlas was built inside the inside the cavern, and this is a very uh, quick. Assembly. You see how the Atlas uh, detector is assembled. These are superconducting coils, with huge superconducting coils to produce a magnetic field. Because in these detectors, of course, when there are charged particles coming out, by bending them, you can measure their, their momentum by the radius of, of curvature. So these are the Atlas coils going into place. And that's a beautiful picture that's been all around the world. Um, you see a person there. Uh, and what, actually what these coils do, they produce a, a very interesting magnetic field that goes around like this. There's no field inside, but the, the field is going around like this. And NASA got very interested in this because, of course, one of the problems of manned sp space travel for long periods is shielding the, uh, uh, the astronauts from, from, from cosmic radiation. Uh, and this would be a wonderful magnetic shield with no magnetic field inside. But I have no idea how they would expect to get something like that into space. <laughs> uh, and this is a picture of Atlas uh, finished. CMS, uh, again, a collaboration of uh, more than 3,000 scientists from 169 institutes in 39 countries. S very similar in size to Atlas, built in a... In, in a uh, in, a, in a different way, actually. CMS was assembled on the surface uh, in big chunks, and this is a superconducting coil, again, in CMS, and lowered down in big pieces, and this is the biggest piece, uh, more than 2,000 tons in one chunk, uh, and barely uh, enough space to put your hand between the, the detector and the wall as it was being lowered. And this is a beautiful picture of, of CMS, the, uh, the from the front. Uh, and there you can see the anatomy of a particle de de detector, actually. You can see, uh, if, if I take a slice of that thing, from the collision point, these particles going out, there are layers. The, the first layer is a tracker where you can actually measure the tracks very precisely. Uh, the next layer is the, what's called the electromagnetic calorimeter, where you can stop the easy stuff. You can stop the photons and the electrons and measure their energy. Then uh, there is what's called the Hadron calorimeter, which is more difficult stuff to stop, like neutrons and protons. Uh, they, they stop, and, and, uh, and you can measure their, their energy as well. Uh, then this is the coil of the, of the superconducting magnet. Uh, and then is the muons, the, the muons. I've spoken a lot about muons. Muons are good charge. They're very hard to stop, but in a magnetic field, they bend. Uh, and you, can, you can't stop them, but you can measure their energy from the curvature. And you, you actually see that. Uh, you can see the layers there, just about. You can see the tracker, the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hydron calorimeter, the coil, and then the, the muon detector. 
Okay, so finally to the Higgs. So I, 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 I said you, you take data and uh, the beam itself will sample the whole spectrum of, it, of mass. And you're looking for the, the resonance, the Higgs to pop up out of uh, that spectrum. And the, 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 the Higgs can de decay in many ways. And uh, uh, there are a few simple ways. This is a Higgs to two photons. Or, or, or a, a, a candidate. So what's happening here is that, the, that a Higgs particle is produced. That particle decays into two photons, and the two photons shoot off back to back in their rest frame. They don't look back to back here because the two, the two quarks uh, might have, will have different energies, so the rest, rest frame is actually moving one way or the other. Uh, but so you, you, you can see the, these two photons. You can measure the uh, energy of the two photons, and you, you can plot a distribution just like I did in the beginning. Uh, this is another one that hints into the, a, a, a good decay mode of the Higgs where it de decays into, into, into four electrons, two electrons, which can be stopped in the detector, and two muons. And I see one of the muon trucks here, and I can't see the other one because of the resolution of the thing. Anyway, um, and this is a, a, in, in Atlas, actually, this is a, a, a a decay which is very easy to see uh, of uh, two, two leptons, two muons here, and, and two electrons. So these are uh, examples, but of course, I, I told you, one in a thousand million um, interactions would be a Higgs particle. And what you've got to do is accumulate data uh, until you, you get a signal. And, and this is it. This is, this is the signal for the, the, the Higgs. So this is a, a two-photon spe uh, spectrum measuring the, the number of events against the energy, and you see a distinct peak at 125 GeV, the mass of the Higgs. We now know, if it is the Higgs, we now know what its mass is. It certainly is a particle. Uh, and it's there in both Atlas and in CMS, which is a very important thing in science, that you have a, a cross uh, uh, confirmation in two completely independent, built in completely different ways, uh, and you see the, the same signal in both channels, Higgs to gamma gamma to two photons, with a mass of 125 GeV. So, but we don't say it's a Higgs. We say that it's a Higgs-like particle. And, and why is that? Well, first of all, we are pedantic. Um, we, we cannot afford to make a mistake. I think enough mistakes have been made with the neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. Uh, uh, so we have to be very careful. And one thing that's needed, the Higgs particles, you remember the spin? The Higgs should have spin zero. Now, we know that the Higgs decays into two photons. And photons have spin one or minus one, left and right polarization. So, the, this decay could be spin plus one minus one, spin zero, or it could be spin plus one plus one, spin two. It's, so it could be a spin zero, spin two. Spin two, nobody, nobody believes. But believing isn't enough. It, it has to be confirmed. Um, and that is, the, that is what is going on now, is to pin down the spin. Uh, and I think, don't hold your breath, I, don't, I think that it will be it will be spin zero, and that result will be published very shortly. Um, and then this is, this is Peter Higgs, who predicted the existence of, the, uh, of, of this particle, a theorist who gets a bit frightened when he sees big experimental apparatus, but uh, he predicted the existence of the, of the Higgs 50 years ago, and hopefully quite soon he can book his ticket to Stockholm. <laughs> so now finally, before I lose you completely, the next step, well, the next step is to, is to, de is to, to, to develop the LHC with all its potential. It, it, it can go higher in energy. There's a huge amount that can be done with it, and I think the LHC itself has got a, got a life of 15 to 20 years of, of experimental work. But now, uh, like, like we discovered the, the Z with the, uh, with the proton machine and then did the very precision physics for the electron machine, 
then that's what the next step we want to do. I told you that we have run out of steam now, bending electrons in a circular uh, orbit. Uh, there is no future. I mean, we just cannot put the energy back in. Uh, and there the trick is to produce linear colliders. And this is a picture of, uh, of, of, of the International Linear Collider. Uh, there's a lot of bending in it. I mean, there are two rings here. But these rings are only at very low energy for accumulating the electrons and the anti-electrons, uh, which are then sent to the end of a LINAC, always at low energy, so you, you don't have synchrotron radiation. And then you accelerate them, but only in a straight line. Uh, and this whole thing is 30 kilometers long. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's a big thing. Um, and that's what we are working on now. Um, and, and hopefully that such a machine will be appro approved. It, it will take at least 10 years to build, probably more. So that then we can, that, then we can take the next step in understanding this very unique and new form of nature. We know that the Higgs field exists. We know that the Higgs particle exists. Uh, um, but we're not finished there. I think we've got the two other big issues to resolve. Um, and the, for me, the biggest fish of all is, uh, is, is dark, dark matter and dark energy. Okay, you've been very patient with me. Let me say that I, I, I think, I hope I've conveyed uh, one thing, and, and that is it's not, all, it's not only science. I think CERN was built <coughs> to bring nations together uh, and it continues to do so as much as ever, and it's as much as ever necessary, uh, the international collaboration in science. Uh, we, we often get criticized for the fact that our science is expensive, you know. Uh, can't you do anything better with the money, etc.? And we, we've, we've got to justify that, of course. Uh, yeah, as you see, I think we are a very well-organized community and, um, we, and we really use all of the world's resources in, in order to be able to, to, to do these things. And, and I, I'm quite amused. Here I've got two, uh, two views of, of, of science from two completely different epochs. Uh, this one comes from, from a Prussian mathematician in the 1930s. Uh, he said, the sole end of science is the honor of the human mind. And I, I, I can... I can imagine going to any funding agency with that argument, uh, asking for a billion quid, <laughs> being kicked out. Uh, but actually, the, 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 best, the best defense of all uh, came from a very unusual source, uh, and that was the Iron Lady herself. Uh, and what she said was, the greatest economic benefit of scientific research has always resulted from advances in fundamental knowledge rather than the search for specific applications. And that is true. But all the way from the discovery of the electron to the discovery of the laser to the World Wide Web even, I think that you get results uh, that, you, uh, that you don't ex expect in doing fundamental research. And that really is the time for me to stop. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, thank. Whoa. Am I on? I get. I get it. Am I on? Oh, okay. Uh, we have time for questions. There is two mics. One a mobile mic, and there is a mic stand. Can somebody help me? I have no idea. I can't see a thing. Where is the mic stand? Over here. Okay. So it's up. I'm pointing. Am I pointing in the right place? Perfect. So there's a mic stand over there. Uh, Dr. Evans would be happy to take your questions for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Don't be shy. Now, if there is a large crush of bodies, I'll, I'll just tell you in advance that if you are this high or shorter, you get preference. I know there's some future science leaders here from Science World. We'd love to hear some of the questions. You can ask him about what he's going to do with all the money that he got from the future <laughs> Fundamental <laughs> Physics Prize. So you got to help me out here. Does somebody have their hand up for a question? Any questions? What would be the cost of the new collider? Is there any estimate on it at all? So the question was, what would be the new cost of the, the new collider? Yeah, well, I, I think... Um, <clears throat> 
this is going to be built in, 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 a, a, uh, in a different way to the LHC. I, I think the, well, the, the LHC is, is a big in, a collaboration with certain member states where the CERN member states actually uh, contribute to the budget of CERN and then CERN buys the stuff, if you like. And small part of it came from, uh, well, small part, 20% came from, uh, from, from outside. Uh, this is going to be on a massive scale. Pieces will be built in, in, in China, in Canada, in the US, in, uh, in India, where, where, wherever. So putting, putting a cost on it is, is much more difficult. But it's going to be a, of the same order of magnitude as the LHC cost, a little bit more. But not, which was four, uh, the LHC cost four billion uh, in whatever unit you want to. <laughs> <laughs> We have a question at the mic here. Hello. Um, where, where are you? I'm over here. Somewhere over here. We, 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 we can't see a thing here. You can tell All right. right. I'm by the stand mic where you pointed earlier. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, how would you use the LHC to search for dark matter or dark energy? Well, we already are. Um, I think the, uh, we, we use the LHC to, to test theories of, uh, of um, of what could, uh, just like we testing the Higgs mechanism, uh, there, is a, there is a theory of supersymmetry, uh, which, is, which says that like there is matter and antimatter, then the, there are particles and supersymmetric partners that we cannot see normally, and the, uh, and the lightest neutral supersymmetric partner could be this dark matter, which is not interacting interacting gravitationally, but not in any other way. So we are testing supersymmetry now. Uh, what we already know is that the, that the simplest, pure vanilla flavor of supersymmetry is not correct. So that at least that's been eliminated. And now uh, we, are, we are testing more sophisticated variants. So we have a question over here. Can you stand up, please? Uh, if you have a question to ask, please Is, stand. Isn't there any way we can put a light on? <laughs> what would they use the LHC for once they've built the new collider? Uh, once they built the new collider, well, the, 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 the LHC would, uh, will, will be running. I mean, the, the, the new collider will not come in operation. It took 16 years to build the LHC. Okay, uh, so the LHC is going to be uh, well into its, uh, its program by the time the new collider comes. Uh, but you see, I mean, uh, you know, the discovery potential is not finished. One thing that you, m you must be very careful about is, like they missed the discovery of superfluidity for 30 years, okay, because they were so focused on new superconductors, etc., then we have to be very careful that in the LHC, we know we are looking for the Higgs. But we want to be careful of what, what we, you know, what we don't know we, we're look, looking, looking for. So the LHC will, will, will be the dis discovery machine, and the new collider will be the precision machine. The LHC will tell the new collider where to go. So we have a question at the mic. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know a lot about the Higgs boson particle, but I'm just wondering, now that you've found it, we'll assume that you have... Uh, how do you take that information and going forward, do you just put a check mark in the column and it's like, yes, we've got it, or uh, what does that imply going forward for you folks? Well, I, I mean, I mean, it's it's a it's it's a, it's a huge step for uh, uh, human in intellect, right? That we, we we know now that there is a new field, uh, the Higgs field, and that is the the source of of uh, the origin of mass. I mean, that's been a huge step in itself. Now we have to measure the properties of the Higgs and make sure that the, it couples correctly, that the, the coupling is proportional to mass, um, and, and, and really understand it. Uh, but we are not going to stop there. I mean, there may well have been more than one Higgs. So, so the, the, we, we still got an awful lot to do uh, with the Higgs, but an awful lot to do elsewhere as well, as I say, for the, looking at the other questions, and, look, and questions that we don't even know how to formulate. 
We've got another question up here. Yeah, a little less technical. What was your response to uh, a lot of the world saying that uh, the LHC would create a black hole and destroy the world? Oh, I think that was great. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> the villain, <laughs> the villain of massive proportions. More seriously, I think uh, uh, there, 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 is, there, there, is, there is behind that there is an issue, and that is. Uh, the dark side of the web. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you, you, you probably know the World Wide Web was, was invented at CERN for our own purposes. And there it turned against us a little bit in that uh, there is such, there's so much information, uh, uninformed information out there on the web now, uh, unfiltered, uh, that creates these kind of situations. I think you know, the, the, the fact that all this rubbish about uh, black holes destroying the world, uh, uh, but th there has been, I know in Switzerland, there's been a, a measles ep epidemic uh, because mothers won't inoculate their babies because of the, the rubbish they're they get, getting off the web. Uh, so that's a real issue, uh, to be honest. I mean, getting quality information, and people say journalism is dead. I think journalism is more necessary than anything anything so that, that informed opinion can be given and not, and not this kind of stuff that creates panic and at least publicity. I, th I think the number of people watching when we switched on the LHC, uh, what, what, what was it? Something like one and a half billion in a day, uh, which, you know, which is pretty, pretty big. Uh, okay, maybe there, were, maybe there was a positive side that it woke people up to, 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 to the collider. But that's the dark side. I think the junk that's going around masquerading as, as a scientific uh, fact. Why did the Oh, well, uh, that's not my fault. I can tell you, we all know. We, we'll ask any scientist in this, in this, in this room. Uh, why, why is the, uh, the Higgs boson called the God particle? Well, it, basically, the, the short answer is to sell books. I won't go any further because it's a friend of mine. <laughs> we, have, we have a question. Uh, yeah, so if you have the Higgs field that gives you mass, didn't that automatically lead to some speculations of unification? Of, of unification of what? Of gravity in the... Ah, uh, no. I, I, th I think uh, uh, there may be some tears in the room. Uh, but integrating gravity into the, into the standard model is, is very, very difficult. This is the realm of, of, uh, of, of string theory. Unfortunately, they, these are the theories that don't predict very much, you know. I, I mean, you have, you have a question, <laughs> what, is it, what, what is a theory? For me, for me is, a theory is something that makes a prediction that you can, you can test experimentally. If you can't do that, it's, it's more like a face than a theory. And, uh, but uh, how, how do you argue that the Higgs field is not also your gra like If the Higgs field creates mass, and if you have mass, you have gravity, how do you argue that you haven't found it? That's all I mean to you. But what, 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 we have not found, uh, what we have not found is the quantum of the gravitational field. Every field should have a quantum of the field. Now, I, I mean, we, it, it's ironic that we've, you know, uh, we've known about gravity for, for thousands of years. Uh, we've known about the possible Higgs field for 50 years. We've discovered the Higgs, but we've not discovered the graviton yet. But it, it's in a completely different, 20 orders, orders of magnitude different energy to, uh, to, 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 to what we're talking about here. We have a question here. <coughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, taking a peek into the future, after we have known practically everything about the universe after the Big Bang. Would the human mind proceed to try to find out what is before the Big Bang? <laughs> well, I, I think there, there, are, there, are already, there are already theories. Uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, the, the uh, dark energy, the, the negative energy, 
there are series, some of the energy of the universe is zero. Therefore, you don't need anything to create it. Therefore, you don't need, uh, so, so that, that you have a, that, uh, there is a multiverse theory that universes are being created all the time in order to avoid the issue of what happened before the Big Bang, which, we, is, a, which is something that we, we are not even equipped to uh, even ask ourselves. So we, ha we have time for a couple of more questions. So there's one at the mic over here, and I don't know if there's another one in the crowd. Not yet. Not yet? Okay, so we have one at the mic, and then we'll... No, uh, yeah, and, and because I can tell you, I've, after this, I've been promised a glass of Welsh whiskey. <laughs> So, yes, yes. What's the largest technical challenge to building the ILC? Uh, the largest uh, technical challenge? Uh, the, the, the ILC is built on, on, on technology. Uh, if I compare it with the LHC, I mean, when, when I started with the, the LHC, uh, the, the technology was, was not very well developed. Uh, operating in superfluid helium uh, with very high field magnets, uh, all of that had to be developed. The ILC is in much better shape. Uh, we, we know how to build, the, of course, the technology in the ILC, it, it's an accelerator. So it, it's got these cavities, that's the main thing. They're super connecting cavities, but there are many, many thousands of them, and they have to operate at a high field. Uh, and I think the biggest challenge, actually, is in large-scale manufacturing, of producing consistent, high-quality uh, high, high in the cavities. We can do that today, we can do it for small samples, uh, but sometimes a cavity turns out not, not to work. Uh, we are now understanding much better, but doing it in an industrial scale, I think that's the biggest challenge. And also in the end, it was a big challenge for the LHC. You saw the size of the kind of industrial production. Okay, so we have one last question and then we have to let Dr. Evans have his whiskey. <laughs> uh, which particles get their mass through the Higgs field and if there are particles that don't get their mass through Higgs, where does that mass come from? I think they all get their mass through the Higgs field if they couple to the Higgs field. Uh, I say the, pho the photon doesn't couple at all to, to the Higgs field, so it's got no mass. So I think that is the universal generator of mass. Uh, to be proved because the strength of the coupling should be proportional to the mass and that's the next thing that we've got to, got, got to, to, to verify. So let's thank Dr. Evans one more time. Thank you.